Hi folks, Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc and today I'm going to really scratch in your salad, even if you're carnivore, because I'm going to completely turn your belief system upside down. We're going to be talking about visceral fat and right out of the gate, I will tell you that visceral fat, the presence of fat in your viscera, the presence of fat in your organs, by its presence, does extremely little harm. And this is the major mistake that we make, is to focus on what we see, the visceral fat, and that is a mistake to focus on visceral fat and assign harm to its presence. <gasps> but everybody says... See... Visceral fat is merely the visible consequence of harm. It's the consequence of harm. It doesn't cause harm. Visceral fat is actually part of the body's final attempt to protect itself from what you are doing to it and how your biology works. Visceral fat is the dysfunctional biologic and hormonal pathway that culminates in visceral fat accumulation. And the problem is your genetic biology and the hormonal disruption that you have caused that results in the deposition of fat in your viscera. And the presence of visceral fat represents a desperate attempt by the body to preserve homeostasis and protect your normal functions. So, harm happens, though, as the system fails in its protective endeavor. So, think of this analogy. Think of a sandbag in a storm. Sandbags may prevent or delay the flooding of a home. But if the water keeps rising and the sandbags are overwhelmed and the house floods. That is the problem. Visceral fat is the sandbag. Your hormonal disruption is the storm, the flooding. And the house are the organs of your body. Maladaptive eating is the flood and the organs of the body are the home. So, difficult analogy to understand, but let's break this down. So, what causes the deposition of visceral fat? And it's caused by the same but opposite reactions in male and female human bodies. Okay. And how does this occur? Well, in males... When you eat a lot of carbohydrate, that carbohydrate has to be distributed and stored. And insulin is the hormone that drives sugar into your cells for storage. Insulin is also the hormone that drives the conversion of sugar to fat in the human body, in the liver, and in the fat cells. And insulin is the hormone that drives the liver to store sugar and in a dysfunctional way to store fat. Now, there are other hormones that act together with insulin. Thyroid hormone T3, active in every cell. Testosterone, active in every cell. And human growth hormone, active in all cells. So those are your four hormones. And insulin regulates all of those other four. Insulin regulates the conversion of thyroid T4 hormone to the active component T3. Insulin regulates something called aromatase activity. And aromatase is an enzyme that fosters in males the conversion of estrogen into testosterone that is then your muscular male distribution hormone, where you've got big muscles, big shoulders, big lats, small waist. Small brain. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Um, insulin regulates 
human growth hormone. Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis, the Carb Addiction Doc, and Ketone IQ supports several university-based studies in the athletic realm, and there's a particular one that they recently published based on performance and recovery. The study itself is in the show notes. So I said, okay, let's try this. And I went out and I did some track running, and I found that Ketone IQ not only depending on whether it was the regular ketone IQ or the caffeine formed ketone IQ and um, the regular form ketone IQ gives you a bolus of ketones, the caffeinated ones from green tea or regular caffeine gives you caffeine as well as the same dose of ketones. And what I noticed is that I'm slow. I'm not an athlete, guys. I'm not an athlete. I'm a fat old man, okay? But I love to run. I love to sprint. And number one, I was faster over 100 meters and 400 meters, and my interval rate where my heart rate comes from a high of around 160 down below 100, which is when I take off again, that interval was significantly shortened on my ketone IQ days than it was me just running um, early morning fasted. Do the experiment, try it, But I strongly recommend, as one of the many things you do, don't just do this, but the heart rate sprints. So insulin regulates when triggered the other hormones, and that's an anabolic hormone. And the hormone that regulates insulin is actually GLP-1. So in males, in males, when there is a decrease, a substantial decrease in testosterone production because you are insulin resistant, aromatase is not acting on insulin, you cannot convert estrogen into testosterone adequately, then you develop visceral fat deposition. The skin lies right on the muscle, there's very little subcutaneous fat, but all the fat is being deposited in the omentum and in the organs of the chest and the belly. That is driven by testosterone. So visceral fat is driven by the absence of testosterone that allows that fat accumulation to sit in the organs of the gut and of the belly and of the chest. And the ability to form that fat and store it outside of regular fat cells, outside of regular fat cells under the skin, is a last-ditch effort by the human body to protect you from what you're eating and drinking based on your genetic and hormonal biology. So the problem here is insulin resistance and a difficulty in forming testosterone. And that is where you get the lean skinny muscles because you don't have testosterone, you don't have human growth hormone to form the big muscles and you get all the visceral fat deposition with a huge big beer belly. And along with that, you're getting other harmful things happening in blood vessels. And those are the people that are metabolically extremely healthy, unhealthy. They've got metabolic syndrome and they're going to die. But it's not about the fat, folks. It's not about the visceral fat. It's about how it got there biologically. And the way you get rid of it is by changing your diet and correcting insulin resistance. Now, in exactly the opposite way in females... We have three hormones. We have progesterone, we have estrogen, estradiol, E2, and we have testosterone. Okay? And in the females, exactly the same process happens except it's polar opposite. In women, the aromatase activity driven by hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance converts excessive estrogen into testosterone. So in these women, we see fairly low progesterone, we see low estradiol, E2, and we see high testosterone, and we can measure that. We also see a very high level of DHEA sulfate, DHEAS, which is a byproduct, and we also see elevated levels of androgen precursors, pregnenolone, androstenedione, we see those hormones increasing. And we see a very low sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, high levels of testosterone. And we measure that. I measure that in all my patients. And those people have polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
They have cognitive impairment. They have hirsutism. And they have visceral fat deposition in females. That's the under androgenic body type. And it is genetically driven, but the activator is hyperinsulinemia. Obesogenic hyperinsulinemia. So it's not about the visceral fat. On the other hand, if you've got people who are genetic, women who are genetically a little bit different, where they can produce high levels of estrogen and they're not converting to testosterone, those women become fluffy fat. They become fat everywhere. A lot of subcutaneous fat, which is estrogen driven. And then you have one further body type in females where they have paradoxically a high level of progesterone, lower testosterone. And those are the women that develop what's called lipedema, L-I-P-E-D-M-A, which is where the majority of the fat is in the buttocks and the thighs and the upper legs, spares the feet, sometimes late can involve the arms as well. But lipedema is primarily a lower half body estrogen, de uh, uh, estrogen de uh, sorry, progesterone dependent subcutaneous fat deposition in these women. And the fluffy fat estrogen dominant women do not have visceral fat. The lipedema women until they get to stage three and four or grade three and four do not have visceral fat. It's the testosterone driven women that have the, t that have the uh, visceral fat. Visceral fat's not the problem. The process that gets you there is. And in the males, they're going to have low testosterone, higher levels of estrogen, higher levels of, oh, sorry, very low levels of sex hormone binding globule. So look at the hormones, not the visceral fat necessarily. Or if you look at the visceral fat, you can work that backwards and tell exactly what those hormones are. And the goal here is to correct insulin resistance and restore normal hormonal cycling if you want to get rid of the visceral fat. But the visceral fat is not harmful. It's the process that gets it there that is. Change your thinking. Because there's a lot of narrative out there. Because all you see is the visceral fat. Because nobody does the blood work. Nobody does the blood work to know. We do. If you're interested, give our practice a shout. Get the blood work done. Folks in our office can review it with you. And we can also suggest a way to correct this. I know this is controversial. I know I'm going to get a lot of blah, 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 blah. If you talk about visceral fat and you cannot show me your insulin, your testosterone, your estradiol, and your progesterone levels, as well as your SHBG and maybe your DHEAS levels, we're not going to have a conversation. 